I start by connecting with the guest ahead of time. If I know them or I followed them or there's some kind of warm connection, I might not have to connect too much. If I don't know them, I may have a quick call with them to develop rapport because I think that's huge. Developing rapport is not only you're getting along, but you're developing trust. Again, another important thing when you're interviewing. If someone shows up, they trust, they understand what's going on, they know what you're doing, what you're about, what you're trying to achieve, what you're talking about, they're going to come in comfortable too. They're going to trust you know, where you're leading them. That's a huge part of it. I will have the call. I will also research them, you know, a little cyber stalking. It's so important because, again, you can touch base with the not just the the topics, but the angle of the topics that really resonate with them. Welcome to another episode of Listeners to Leads, where I'm helping podcasters launch and maintain a lead generating show. I'm your host, Alicia Galati, the CEO and head podcast strategist behind Galati Media, a full service podcast management company. On this show, you'll hear my guests and I discuss everything it takes to launch a successful podcast and keep it running. If you're ready to get leads, land speaking gigs, and create deeper connections with your audience through your podcast, then this is the show for you. For this episode, I am chatting with my incredible friend as well as client, Lisa Zarotny. She is a fantastic podcaster and an incredible interviewer. So I'm having her on the show to talk about how to plan an interview podcast. During this episode, we are talking about processes for selecting and planning your content. So as you're planning who needs to be on your show, preparing for an interview as an interviewer, and how to stay on track during the interview process so that your guest doesn't get super distracted, you don't get distracted, and everyone gets the clear message of what you want that podcast episode to be about. Lisa gives great tips and strategies. Definitely look out for when I ask about those difficult ways to navigate conversations, especially when the guest kind of derails. So check out this episode. I'm so excited about it. Here you go. Welcome, Lisa. I'm so, so, so like happy dance over here. So stinking excited to talk to you today. If you could just start off by telling the audience who you are, what you do, what's your jam, all that fun stuff. I would be delighted. Okay, on a personal note, I am a wife and a mom of two kiddos. I got a tween and a teen. So you know, you know how things are for me here. (laughs) And on a professional side of things. I am the founder of Positively Productive Systems, the host of the Positively Living podcast, and I'm a productivity coach working with creative, multi-passionate women who are like balancing all the things, business and family and all the passions, and helping them manage their time and stress so they can do less, achieve more, and avoid burnout. Yes, I am all for all of those things as a mother and business owner and all around stress out person, typically. (laughs) I love what you do. I think it's so important. Uh, You were my very first podcasting client. I have just like seen you bloom into this awesome podcaster host role that I just, uh, it's so wonderful to see. I love what you do with your interviews. You have a mostly interview show. Yes, you throw some solos in there, but you're typically doing interviews. And anytime that we have any clients who are like, hey, I need help with my interview style. I don't know how I'm going to interview. I tell them to listen to your show because I think you do it so well. So we're going to talk about all that today. (laughs) You are planned out with your content months in advance. You are pitching people to be on your show, asking for the right kinds of people to be on your show. How does that work for you? Because I know you and I don't do that together. Yes, we do have clients that I do that with them on like a monthly basis because they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. (laughs) But you have like got it nailed down. So how did you like come up with this process to be able to, all right, I have this plan. I have this vision of what my podcast content is going to be and I'm going to run with it. I know what I'm going to be talking about. Okay. So for starters, I started with you and we had conversations and I took what you said to heart, knowing your audience, knowing why you are doing your podcast in the first place, you know, getting that clarity up front. It's huge. So 
I created filters based on that. I'm like, why am I doing this podcast? What am I trying to achieve? This is my anchor content for my business. It shows my authority. It helps people understand what it is that I do, what I'm all about. And really, I know who my audience is and what I want them to come away with each and every episode. Now, it may be different types of information, but it's sort of a concept. And I think with everything that I do, there's a framework in mind. I create filters on what content is allowed in or not based on my audience. And in part, because I created the marketing mantra for my business, which is do less, live more, breathe easier. So it's an overarching kind of, I guess, umbrella almost, if you will, where it's like, if you pitch to me and you say, I'd like to talk about giraffes, I'd be like, (laughs) does it meet that criteria? You know, it's like, well, we use giraffes in a really up and coming stress management technique. And I'm like, well, then that fits. You know what I mean? Okay, giraffes are literally my favorite animal. There's a giraffe behind me. Like, okay, guys, yes, can we come up with that? Somebody send me a DM and let me know. <laughs> yeah, and then I will totally interview them on my po- I'm we're, we're there for it. So this will be a plan. See? See how easy it is to create content? <laughs> so yeah, creating those filters and going back each and every time, really revisiting it, kind of saying, okay, what am I trying to achieve here? So as you're searching, as you're having conversations with people, When I have my meetings with you and I ask you, hey, do you know anyone who's doing interesting, unique things with stress management now or whatever it is that I'm looking for? And I kind of cycle through these. And then again, going back to the audience, like what do I want for them and structuring each episode in a way that I think they would want and that I would want. And for me personally, did that make sense? Could it be followed? (laughs) And what do I do with this information? And that's important to me because I'm a productivity coach and taking action is a big part. So it just all can expect that way. There's so much you said there, but I want to pull out what you mentioned about your mantra, which is do less, live more, breathe easy. Now I talk a lot about your content buckets. Mine are podcast marketing, podcast content, podcast a lot, like five main things. We're going to talk about those. Great. But I love that yours is a mantra because it kind of, it gives you some wiggle room Mm -hmm. to be able to talk about some different things that are still very, very applicable to your audience, but also don't like box you in too much to where you're like, I can't talk about that. And I really want to. Yeah, that was a big reason why, even though my business is positively productive and I am a productivity coach, albeit one that's more holistic and brings a different kind of vibe to it. You know, I'm trying to redefine productivity, but I didn't want that to be the name because I didn't want that to be the immediate assumption that we're only talking productivity. We're talking about life. We're talking about living. That's the whole point of being productive. So wiggle room was definitely important to me. Yes. From a holistic standpoint, you're talking primarily in your podcast content to working, sometimes entrepreneur or nine to five type moms who are, you know, struggling to do all the things, but they also are like, I am done (laughs) doing all of the things, please and thank you. And I know I had a fantastic strategy session with you. If you need help, please go to Lisa because she's fantastic and wonderful. So how are you structuring your content on a month-to-month basis to be able to kind of hit all of those different parts of that holistic overview of do less, live more, breathe easy? Mm, That's a great question because sometimes there's a little bit of art involved in terms of reaching out to people that I had in mind that I want to bring on the podcast and finally hearing from them and being like, okay, Now we have a couple different great guests who are really awesome at things like branding and marketing and copy. So I sort of create a cluster or a theme that goes with maybe like a month, let's say. It's not too rigid because, again, sometimes you're waiting for someone to respond to you that you really want to interview. I have one in mind right now. I'm so excited that I've just sent her the official invitation. And so that'll depend. It's really like a puzzle piece. But for the most part, I try to create themes like for the month, maybe if I can, you know, I thought about July and and I created the overarching theme of freedom. So then it was a combination of things like, you know, taking a social media detox. And then I talked about freedom from the hustle and hustle culture and just putting things together like that. But yeah, it's a little bit of 
theming and a little bit of like art mixed in. Yes. <laughs> and I think it also gives us space. You're a productivity coach, so obviously space is important here. <laughs> yeah. You have permission as a podcast host to do whatever you want. So if someone's getting back to you and it's taking them a while and you're like, we might need to switch this up a little bit, that's okay. It's okay to re-release episodes that aired a year ago if they're relevant for now or you want to take a break. That's okay. Like there's so many different ways that you can go about creating content for your podcast without feeling like you're running on a hamster wheel and you just cannot get off. <laughs> yeah. And so one of the things that you mentioned was that I do plan way ahead of time and I try to batch and record ahead of time. My goal is not too far ahead of time only because I've found that when I keep it somewhere in the four to six week zone, it keeps the energy up with the guest and they're still excited and they haven't been like, oh, I was on that podcast. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and I get it because I've been there. There's been some podcasts where I'm like, oh, Huh, I'd forgotten I was on that. Six months later. <laughs> exactly. So I'm trying again to find that balance. But at the same time, if someone else jumps in and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's relevant. I'm going to pop that in and maybe bump someone else. You know, yeah, you do have to play with it depending upon where you're trying to go, maybe what's happening. And especially if you have a podcast that's relating to current pop culture or, you know, something that's happening. If, it has to tie back into what you're doing. Thankfully, I'm talking about life and I can go with it. Sometimes there are things that I want to address because it's critically important. And other times I can say, you know, no matter what we're going through right now, this still applies. You put your heart and your soul into your show. And I want to help you reach all of those potential listeners out there. That's why I'm excited to announce my upcoming podcast marketing workshop. It's about giving you practical tools to grow your audience. You'll learn the secrets to getting your podcast discovered, attracting your dream listeners, and boosting those download numbers. This workshop will be hosted live with a replay available on April 30th. You can sign up by going to galatimedia.com slash workshop. Let's grow our podcasts together. Going back to you being a freaking incredible interviewer, <laughs> how do you prepare? Because I know that you go in fully prepared. This is what we're going to talk about. And you're so good at keeping people on track, but we're not going to go there yet. <laughs> <But> <laughs> preparing for the interview. How do you do that? Is it in your questionnaire specifically that you are asking the right questions? Or is it in your own work that you're doing? Tell us all your secrets. <laughs> Shh. Okay. It's just going to be between you and me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you said right there, though, going in prepared, I think that that's huge. Plan as much as you can. Also, potentially be ready to have it fly out the window because sometimes, you know, winging it is the thing that has to happen. But going in prepared, I honestly believe that that helps keep you calm and focused and it really helps you stay present because to me, that's what being a good interviewer is, is being fully present. So I start by connecting with the guest ahead of time. If I know them or I followed them or there's some kind of warm connection, I might not have to connect too much. If I don't know them, I may have a quick call with them to develop rapport because I think that's huge. Developing rapport is not only you're getting along, but you're developing trust. Again, another important thing when you're interviewing. If someone shows up, they trust they understand what's going on. They know what you're doing, what you're about, what you're trying to achieve, what you're talking about. They're going to come in comfortable too. They're going to trust, you know, where you're leading them. That's a huge part of it. I will have the call. I will also research them, you know, a little cyber stalking. It's so important because again, you can touch base with the, not just the, the topics, but the angle of the topics that really resonate with them. Case in point, I mentioned giraffes to you because I saw a giraffe <laughs> in the background. You know what I mean? It's paying attention to things like that. Thinking of questions as you go, obviously, I collect a lot of information in the form ahead of time, which in part makes sure that I'm vetting them properly. And I even had someone recently tell me she could tell I really cared about my audience because I was very specific and I had a lot of questions and I had a lot of follow up with her before I said yes to having her be on the podcast. 
And she's absolutely right. So questions beforehand. And then I think of questions that I want to ask and just keep tracking them. I think of what I want to know, what my audience would probably want to know, what they would ask. Sometimes I ask my audience. I have a checklist so that I know what I need to have ahead of time. I have a template for each and every interview that has the guest. And sometimes ahead of time, I I know or I have on my checklist for when I interview how to pronounce the name, (laughs) because that's a big one. Hi, coming from the name Lisa Zarotny here. I kind of have to do that. I have everything sort of the framework built out so that I know where I'm going. And I've kind of prepped with like questions that I would have in mind for them. It may go in a different direction, but at least I know that I can properly and confidently lead the conversation, which is my job as an interviewer. Yes. Uh, lead the conversation. I love that so much because you've had guests on. And I remember toward the beginning, you were getting people on who maybe had never ha- been on a podcast before. And so making sure that they're super comfortable, they're still giving value to your audience, having a team behind you editing. So it takes out those you know awkward pauses or like, mm, do we want to take it in this direction? Yes, I think we do. You know, <laughs> like that's really important as well. Or just taking the time yourself to do that, really being able to lead the conversation. So that leads us to the next one, <laughs> staying on track. I know that you have had, and I know these things, guys, because I'm her podcast manager. So <laughs> that's how I know these things. But you had someone recently where it was like, I don't know that this conversation is going the direction I need it to. So let's talk about that first. How do you kind of redirect conversations when you feel like this is taking a turn that I'm not that I don't love it because it's a conversation, but I don't know that it's going to bring value. So let's move it back to what we were talking about. Yeah, that's such a good question. And some of it is finessing, but it's again goes back to having this framework and understanding right away, what do I want to get out of this conversation? What is the purpose of having this? What do I want the audience to get out of it? It's like when you put an address in the GPS, and then you have stopping points along the way. I kind of have that in a way because of the bullet points that I keep and the questions that I'm going to ask. It's like, okay, we started here and tell me your story. And you may, you may take the story, you know, this is like uh, novella time, you know, John Steinbeck's going, wow. It's a matter of kind of waiting for a pause in the conversation to say, okay, that ties in beautifully to, and then you throw in the segue to say, or that makes me think of, or, you know, it's, it's gently stepping in and saying, okay, I think what you're saying is this, you know, so that kind of comes from my coaching background too, where I can maybe do a quick synopsis or kind of have an understanding of what they're saying, or maybe just summarize it quickly and say, now taking that, where would we go with this? And I go to the next point. Those are some tricks. But again, a big part of that is knowing where you want to go and listening to what they're saying. Being present, like you said earlier, in the conversation can be really difficult if you don't have that predetermined direction of where you want the conversation to go. Because Right now, my brain is going in like 15 different directions, but I have to remember, okay, this is a podcast for podcasters. What do they want and need to know from Lisa's awesome experience and how can they get value out of this? As much as I would love to sit here and talk to you about drafts, (laughs) we can't (laughs) or talk about your kids or anything else like Like, yeah, those things tie into who you are as a person. And it's great to be able to share your story and share different aspects of yourself. But always keeping in mind, what does your audience need? What can you pull from your guest in like the most loving way possible (laughs) to be able to direct the conversation? So you're saying having those bullet points is definitely going to keep you on track. Now, I am an Enneagram one, so I like a plan. (laughs) I like the bullet point idea. What if it doesn't work? The conversation is just like going an entirely different direction. And I know what I would do because I would just throw the whole thing out the window. (laughs) But what would you do? Okay, so 
One of the things I want to mention quickly is that if bullet points really aren't your thing or that feels too structured, think about if you have ever tried mantra-related meditation. And I promise you when I've done mantra-related meditation that I'm trying to say the mantra and suddenly I'm like developing my shopping list and I'm wondering if my son did his chores and I'm like so distracted. And the concept with that is it's building a muscle. So you bring it back, you bring it back to the mantra, you bring it back to the mantra. So even if you only have one word or a mantra or setting an intention, that's a big part of what I do for the interview. I want to have conversation where I get this person's story and we inspire the audience to take action in this way. That's it. If you think about that always and you say, it's sort of like an ongoing filter, like, is this conversation feeding into that? If it goes completely off the rails, it could still feed into that. If it goes completely off the rails and you're like, I don't know about this, <laughs> then you make a note to be like, okay, at this point, like, and I'm taking notes the whole time, just very quickly jotting down stuff so I can go back to it and then immediately be present again. Okay. Our minds cannot multitask truly. We can't focus on two things at once, but I can make a quick note and then lift my head back up and keep paying attention. So I make a note of maybe where things went off <laughs> that we may cut that part. And then I create a new segue. It's like editing a chapter and being like, okay, we're cutting, you get an editor and they're like, we're cutting this part of the chapter. And then we start here and it makes sense. So that's a way that you can salvage it. And you could even say, that's completely understandable. And I love that you shared that. Now, let's focus on what we can do about it, you know, or whatever it is. You bring them back on track. It's just the difference between sometimes it's a little nudge and sometimes it's let me get behind you and give you a shove. <laughs> I'm thinking about all of the times that my seven-year-old, he has to be talking from the time he wakes up to the time he goes to bed. He's an extrovert. And so he just wants to be in conversation. He wants to be talking, he wants to be doing and, and going. And I'm an introvert and my husband's an introvert. And we are like, can you just stop for five <laughs> seconds? Like, how many times are you going to ask me about the, my favorite dinosaur? I've already told you at least a hundred times. It's a Spinosaurus. Come on. <laughs> Trying to redirect him to, okay, we need to be focusing on food right now. And sometimes it is that little nudge. And sometimes it's like, listen, you need to stop talking and eat your food. How do you do that nicely? <laughs> because in my brain, like I said, Enneagram one, and I'm like, things are a certain way. They have to be a certain way. So if they don't go that way, throw it away. The whole thing's trash. I'm trash, you're trash, everything's <laughs> trash. <laughs> Completely transparent here in my Enneagram oneness. But like, how do you very lovingly move the conversation without making the other person feel like they totally messed up? There are so many ways that you can do that that are gentle. Some of them are just instinctive on my part because that's my nature, you know, to be... But there's this element of just acknowledging because, again, this is a conversation. It's a recorded conversation. You are using it to present to your audience. So that's that element. But you are still having a conversation. So keep going back to the basics, which is if you were having a conversation with someone and they were going on and on and on and on, kind of like I am right now, they want to be heard. They want to be acknowledged. So you step in and acknowledge that. Absolutely. That must have been so difficult for you. You know, that was a really brave thing you did. That's a really interesting point. You, whatever, you know, just something that acknowledges and says, I've heard you. You can even say, you know, well, that paints a picture for us so we can understand where you're coming from with this. Now, what did you do next? It, it is the art of redirect and it does take some practice, but that's also something that you can do is you're listening right now, if there was something that I said where you're like, ooh, that's a good one, write it down and start practicing using it when you are talking and, you know, then they're saying something. I guess it's also being confident enough to to step in without feeling like you're stepping over them. Sometimes you only have a little moment and other times you have a big pause like this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think it really is a finesse to it and an art. And it's not something that you're just going to be really good at right away, which is why I tell people to listen to your show, because it does take practice. I'm curious, did you have prior interviewing 
type experience before you became a podcaster? I worked in the corporate world and maybe interviewed people here or there. I don't really think there was anything that was specific about it, but I will tell you this. I listened to a lot of good interviewers. I made notes about, I was like, oh God, that was good. That was so smooth. That was really, they ask interesting questions. You know, I'm a natural questioner, so I knew that I could lean into that. But at the same time, listening to people that you're like, I really like their style and making notes of how they do it, preparing yourself so that you're ready. I naturally have so many questions, but I prepare a bunch so that if there's a moment I'm never going to be without a question. And there are even some really great standard ones. You can always ask if you feel like, you know, like I'm I'm lost. And it can always be like, what did I miss? What didn't I ask you that you'd love to talk about or whatever? You know, I mean, there's always ways. I also did like small, really short interviews in my gratitude group. I did like stories where it was just focused on one topic. And that was a great practice for me to have a set questions that were the same questions and then just practice it over and over again to kind of get the pattern or the rhythm of of conversation that way. So th- those were all the things that I did to kind of prepare. Yes. And I think it's completely different. And this is just from my own experience. I think it's different when you're interviewing someone who is like a friend someone you know, and then someone you don't know, the energetically, the way you go into it, like you want to be consistent with that energy for your audience and keeping them in mind. But I tend to see that when podcasters have like a biz bestie on, they tend to like all around the forest and then (laughs) they get to the cottage and it's like, okay, we finally got there. Whereas like, When you have that structure, okay, let's like focus here. We can have a Zoom call later to talk about what's going on. (laughs) That's important too when you are looking at the different types of people that you're interviewing and you're going to approach them differently to redirect them. Like my biz bestie, I can tell her, all right, we need to get back on track. Come on. (laughs) Yeah, and you could totally leave that in there if you have that comfort level. So I think it's an important point. I think it's even more important to be structured when you have like the biz bestie. I mean, even I know that you and I are like, stay focused, stay focused, because we could we could easily have so much fun all over the place. But we want to make sure you walk away with ideas and inspiration to have a better interview. So we're here. We're here for it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a sliding scale there. If you have a bestie, you could be like, all right, back on track. And sometimes I'll do that because I'm a goofball and I'm kind of known for that. But other times, if you feel like someone might be more sensitive, then you can use that more finessed art of redirect. Yes. (laughs) Love it. So is there anything else that you want us to cover before we wrap this up? Anything that you're like, okay, you guys have to have this. If you didn't get anything from this episode, get this. See, and that was a really great question right there. So I'm going to take a look at my notes. First of all, I really believe in notes. Again, because it gives you that focus and that presence that we talked about. Make sure that you put yourself in a position where you're not worried and distracted about other things. And that's just a productivity technique right there. Test your equipment out ahead of time. Get them on and make sure you're answering their questions and you've tested out the equipment. Set a silent timer if you need to so that you're not constantly watching the clock and worried. It's, you know, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but there's options to keep you on track so that you can stay in the moment. It does help, though, if you have like 30 minutes to talk, if at 15 you have a silent timer go off so that if you're like, oh, I wanted to talk about these three things and make sure that we had this thing at the end where they have an action item that you don't run out of time. Again, have those questions you want to ask, have filler questions ready. What would you ask me or or things like that? And take notes. Even while you're listening, if you need to, I do that. And I love that. I have little codes for myself, like asterisks indicate things that I want to put in the show notes that, you know, links or, or they referenced a book or something like that, because I know that that's important to me to give to my audience. So I think that would be it is prepare to be present. So tell everyone where they can find your podcast, where they can find you, what's your favorite place to hang out, because everybody needs to just go hang out with Lisa. Yeah, because we'll have so much fun. Yeah. Okay, you can find the Positively Living Podcast (laughs) (laughs) on all major platforms. So pick one, or you can go to PositivelyProductive.com, my main website, slash podcast, to locate me and my favorite place to play 
Instagram all the way. Positively underscore Lisa. You can find me there. And we'll have all those links in the show notes. Apple users who don't have links anymore. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> you can go to aliciagalati.com and get all of the links in the show notes there to hang out with Lisa. Definitely check her out. She's incredible. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being on the show. I so appreciate you taking your time to do this, giving us so much goodness on how to be better interviewers because it is, it's so important. <laughs> it is. And it's my pleasure and you can do it. Just keep doing it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Listeners to Leads. If you found something in this episode valuable, I would really appreciate it if you shared it with a friend who you know would also get value from it. Want to send me a message? My favorite place to hang out is Instagram. You can find me at alicia.lottie. Let me know what your favorite takeaway was from the episode. And don't forget, turning those listeners into leads is actually easy. 